I think it's probably time we make a start. And it's really lovely to see so many of you um, here for our conversation today where we launch um, the Future of Work and Care white paper and think about um, the creche care pilot program at Western Sydney University's Liverpool campus that took place earlier this year. Um, my name's James Gawley, uh, and I'm going to host our conversation today. Um, and as I was just saying to some of my, uh, some of the participants, my task is to stay in the corner. So I'll try and do my best to do that. Um, I'm a researcher and teacher of literary studies and environmental humanities and a member of Western Sydney's advisory group for supporting HDR student parents. In commencing our conversation today, I want to begin by respectfully acknowledging country um, and I'm participating from sovereign Darug country. So I want to um, acknowledge the Darug people's ongoing care for this country and also country's enduring care for Darug and all beings. Having thought a lot about today's conversation, it feels important to acknowledge the diverse caring practices of the Darug people here and of First Nations communities across the Australian continent, which have been practiced and refined over tens of thousands of years. When thinking about childcare models and provision, a reminder of First Nations emphasis on holism and reciprocity are good places to begin. So both the white paper and the creche care pilot are the consequences of lots of hard work among diverse teams. So on behalf of all of us, I'd like to thank um, a number of people now, and I'm not sure if Jenna Condy is joining us today. Um, so like she's giving me the nod. So Jenna, I hope everything's going well and it's really lovely to see you. And we, of course, all thank you for your leadership um, and advocacy in this issue and many others. Um, I'd also like to thank Karen Wallage and the team at Liverpool City Council. Um, Brian Stout, uh, who is the provost of the Liverpool campus. Uh, our friends and colleagues at Liverpool Neighbourhood Connections, including Pat Hall, Nidhi Markande and Serena Torelli. The Education and Work Research Theme Champions, Maria Estella Varua and Katrina Barker. And of course, all our panellists today and all of the authors of the white paper. And it's a diverse bunch, uh, a wide bunch in both those groups. I also wanted to say my sincere thanks to Salakshi Malawa Arachi, who is moderating today's conversation. And just to let you know that Salakshi is about to uh, press record um, and the conversation will be recorded. Uh, please get in touch with us if that's going to be a problem for you. And we kind of think that the general protocol is if you're not comfortable to uh, participate in the recording, now might be the time to turn off your camera. Uh, we also wanted to say that the chat will be moderated and we do uh, expect the normal standards of respectful conversation will be adhered to. Um, if you have comments or questions, please feel free to pop them into the chat when the time is right, whenever they occur to you. Um, and when we get to the Q&A session, you'll be all free to unmute and contribute in a bunch of different ways. So I'm gonna just give the briefest of context establishing remarks, and then I'm going to throw to our panelists. So we're living in precarious times. In the aftermath of a global pandemic where caring duties became more visible to some, but also facilitated new conversations about structural and equity issues regarding access and affordability to caring services. The present cost of living crisis means that pressure on those with caring responsibilities and carers themselves has increased. Greater Western Sydney and the university embedded in and existing for this region is not immune from these challenges. Today, we get to hear from those thinking about how the future of work and care can be equitable and just, and our speakers have lived experience of these challenges. We then turn to discuss one possible response, a partnership model for creche care at Western Sydney University's Liverpool campus which shows that alternative childcare models are not only feasible, but bring distinctive community-led benefits. Nidhi, I'll do my best to speak as loudly as possible. Um, and if anyone else is having the same problem, then please let me know and I'll stop muttering. So our conversations start with a panel on the future of work and care white paper before 
before turning on to the report on the crash care program. Um, and so I'd like to welcome the first three panelists who are Donna James, Veronica Rogers, and Kate Huppatz. Um, Veronica is a student with us and Kate and Donna are staff members. And so we're first gonna hear from Donna and we're just doing some work in the background to pin those contributors now. So Donna, can you tell us a little bit um, about the white paper um, and especially its goals, please? Yeah, sure. So the white paper emerged, I think it's really important to acknowledge that it emerged out of a kind of collective discussions about lived experiences among students and staff. And uh, Dr. Jenna Condi, as you know, is a big advocate for um, equality and social justice and was party to a number of these conversations, um, some which involved me. And uh, these conversations have been ongoing, but certainly throughout the pandemic, James, as you acknowledge, we saw some really kind of problematic issues with people trying to manage care alongside work um, and women were um, really impacted by that. And we saw the impacts throughout and beyond our university community um, and also throughout the Western Sydney region. So Dr. Condi brought together researchers from all over the university because it is a interdisciplinary topic. So people who were working on all elements to do with our work and care and had this idea that we should, um, you know, have a look at what already exists in terms of what do we already know about care and work nexus and infrastructures in the Western Sydney region, um, but also to identify where there are gaps and who's, you know, falling between these gaps and what, um, how we might rethink the way that these childcare systems are working. Um, and we were really kind of adamant and, you know, Dr. Connie was a big advocate for not going back to normal after the pandemic and rethinking these models um, that were creating um, these um, inequities. So we took this uh, anti-colonial intersectional feminist approach to uh, pulling together this white paper. And we weren't just thinking about what kind of knowledge existed and how to leverage that knowledge. But also, you know, what was producing this knowledge and how was the production in knowledge potentially um, creating or reproducing some of these inequalities? Um, we did some mapping work because we really wanted to look at the Western Sydney region um, and to consider how disadvantage is socially stratified and therefore how, you know, inequality in the childcare and work nexus um, falls along those lines of social stratification. Awesome. Thanks very much, Donna. Um, I reckon you've already answered a fair bit of my second question, so I'm not sure that I'm going to ask you that one. But I wanted to ask you a little bit about this idea of normalcy as well. Um, and, of course, we're probably, many of us, quite tired of the idea of new normals, which was a pretty repeated phrase. Um, I remember 2021, especially, that being pretty dominant. Um, so I was just wondering if you can tell us a little bit about the idea of these diverse normals. So what are the situations that the white paper identifies, um, but what also are the kind of future directions in more specific terms that you um, and the white paper identify? And I suppose I'm trying to understand about how normal might map onto the justice and equity framework that you spoke of. Yeah, sure. So I think I'm um, important to kind of locate that the normal system is a heteropatriarchal colonial system. It very much emphasizes um, uh, economics, you know, so a lot of the conversations around childcare about how do we get people back into work. Um, and obviously, we acknowledged in our paper that that is important, but from the sense that if women want to work, they should have opportunities. Um, or if carers want to work, there should be opportunities, but it shouldn't just be kind of this emphasis on people returning to work to support the economy. Um, and so our white paper looked from the very beginning at, you know, the um, perinatal stage, and it looked at the way that uh, we need to consider things like a women's right to uh, breastfeed if they want to breastfeed and, you know, the importance of extended breastfeeding for child development and how our systems don't actually kind of recognise that critical need. Um, all the way to through to thinking about, you know, the way that these systems are designed through hetero heteropatriarchal uh, colonial frameworks that kind of centre this idea of 
you know, whiteness, um, the white kind of economic contributor. And in doing that, forget that there are all of these really unique lived experiences that don't talk to that model. And so just to give some examples, um, we looked at the experiences of migrant um, women who um, have different access to social supports, but also have, you know, unique uh, circumstances. Um, and we looked um we, we also looked at the way that the tools that measure what a family is and, and what caring is are quite colonial. So if we think about the census, um, distinguished professor Bronwyn Carlson has criticised the census because it doesn't recognise the um, First Nations families and the way that constructs of care are understood in those contexts. So it's not just, you know, not going back to normal in terms of sticking with this model of working from home and having our children with us at home that became really prominent, but it's about thinking about who's falling between the gaps and who does this system not work for and who's being failed by this system. And not only how do we address that by making sure we've got forms of care that recognise that, but what are the tools that are being used to measure and decide what kind of care is needed where funding is uh, provided, who can access things like the childcare subsidy and paid parental leave. I hope that answered your question. No, it definitely did. <laughs> and I suppose just just to, I, I, I suppose you've addressed this in part, but for me, it's something to continue to clarify, which is that I, uh, understanding the present and thinking about the future, I take it is also about then imagining better futures, not only for work, but also for care and their relation. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things we kind of draw on in the report too is in areas of social disadvantage, when people can't afford or access childcare, just one example is it puts pressure on parents to enroll their children into public, into the schooling system earlier. And that actually has developmental implications for the child which end up reproducing that social inequality. So if we want to overcome these um, stratified social inequalities, we need to make sure that the support is equal from the very beginning so that people aren't feeling kind of forced into a corner. Um, and something we reflect on in our report too, when we look at this from kind of a geographical uh, stratified standpoint, is that in very affluent areas around Sydney, we have what's called a childhood oasis, which is lots and lots of childcare centres that opens up accessibility to more people, but it also means they have choice in the kind of care that they have. In disadvantaged areas, we have what's called a childcare desert, which means there's a critical shortage of childcare. That not only influences accessibility, but it also means that the quality of care isn't as good because there's less pressure on those providers to have to meet kind of the minimum standard. So when you've got um, higher demand than you have supply of childcare, there's kind of no pressure to perform Whereas in the affluent areas, it's not just the accessibility and affordability and more options, it's also higher quality childcare because there isn't that, um, you know, that kind of endless stream of people to take up places. Thanks, Donna. It's interesting also how that language of oases and deserts speaks to a really polarising, increasingly polarised experience. Um, yeah, which is something for us to continue to discuss, I think. So thanks very much, Donna, and um, Veronica, it's lovely to see you on the Zoom. So I'm going to come across to you now. So Veronica is a student with us at Western Sydney University, um, and you've got some lived experience that corroborates some of Donna's observations. So I'm just wondering, to start off in a gentle uh, fashion, if you can tell us a little bit about yourself and your experiences. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, I am a social work student. I have, I'm in my, I'm about to commence my final year um, and I have four children under the age of 10. So study is, uh, is fairly challenging. Um, I started studying when my third child was one and I used to bring her onto campus with me. Um, she used to sit with me in the classes in the pram and then we went into lockdown in the times when the when the campus was open and I was able to bring in the, the youngest one who was only quite young when I was coming in and out of campus um, she I was lucky enough to bring her with me but I think because I'm in the social sciences um, there's a more of an acceptance of being able to bring my child to uni with me and I never had any problems with it but I can only imagine if I was say a nursing student how challenging that would be so I'm really passionate about um, you know parents having access to care on campus, um, as it was mentioned by Donna, childcare is very difficult in the West. 
Um, I am I'm very fortunate to have a very good centre that I've had all of my children attend. However, if I was one of the parents who couldn't access childcare, um, study would be impossible um, for me to come to class. And I've mentioned to Charlotte and um, some of the other people on Intergena as well that um, I call myself a, a shift student because when I get to the kids to sleep at 10, I um, that's when I kind of start studying until about 2 a.m. Then I'll sleep for a couple of hours and I'll get up early in the morning and continue like study for a bit before they wake up and then continue on with my day. And it kind of happens in shifts. Um, it does affect the quality of the work that I can do because in the in the however many weeks that I was attending the crash, that extra four hours that I was getting a week, I was less stressed. I was producing better work. Um, I was able to attend to my family. I was happier just with four hours. I can only imagine if the crash was there on a more permanent, um, on like on a more, more permanent position so that I could attend when I had classes and I could do group work and all of those things that most people will take like they take for granted, but for as a parent, you have all of those other things. You know, you have to attend the school, everything for schools and if your child's sick and so on. So at least this way, just having that access when I was on campus just gave me so much flexibility and just the time. It's it's all about time. And I just, this, I need an extra 24 hours in my day. And to be a student, you, you're already lacking time. And then when you've got kids on top of it, so... It was just, it was really, really, I, I didn't even attend campus on Fridays. I made the effort to attend on those days only because Kresh was there because I knew I'd get the support. I stayed close by. I knew she was well looked after, but I was able to concentrate with my mind on one thing, not multiple things. Um, yeah, so that's just a little bit of my background. And it is just really good. The only, I was looking at the list of things that I was suggested to speak about. Um, the only thing that I could add to this and I know it kind of supports parents is that if in terms of our carers position at the university if parents could be recognized as a carer I mean carers are recognized as you know the carers of an elderly person I also am looking after my mum as well as well um, my father passed away this year so I'm looking after her so if we could be recognized as a carer because we have very individual um, needs if a child's sick and your assessment's due, you're not going to do your assessment and, you know, the, your priorities kind of get shifted. So for, for parents to be recognised as carers would also help with with um, supporting what you're doing as well. And part of that as well, Veronica, is um, for universities to understand that we are not a standalone institution, but we are embedded in um, people's lives and people's lives are embedded in lots of different institutions as well. Mm -hmm. um, you, you're right. You have answered all the questions I've written down for you. So I'm going to ask you a couple of other ones instead. Uh, I know that this isn't a simple question to answer, but in your experience, are university campuses more accommodating to younger children than older children? Or is it uniform that a one-year-old and a nine-year-old are viewed the same on a university campus? So I can answer that question because I've come with my nine and my 10-year-old and I've come with my one and two-year-old. Um, it's definitely geared to caring for younger children. There is no place, like on school holidays when I bring the older ones, they sit right next to me, they have their iPad, they have their headphones and they're quiet for the two hours that they're there. There is no, there's nowhere for them to be. I had one wonderful tutor one year who gave them whiteboard markers and told them to go crazy in the, in the back of the class. And that was brilliant, but um, no, it is not geared towards younger children. And the thing is, children are kind of seen from school age and under. However, the, the university calendar tends to not run along the school holidays. It tends to, you get holidays when the kids are at school and as soon as they break, we go back. So um, you still have you still have that issue, and as you know, out of school care and after school care, those children age out at twelve. I'm not leaving a twelve year old just to fend for themselves at home. So if I'm if I happen to come to campus and my I continue on studying and I have to bring a twelve year old, then I, on school holidays I'll have to bring him because there's nowhere to go. So it's definitely geared towards the younger ones, hundred percent. And it also speaks to as well. I mean. 
some kind of traditional expectations of universities as quiet, solemn spaces as well, and the the way that that continues to uh, inform many people's understandings of campuses as well. I suppose I've got one more question, and again, I'm sorry for putting you on the spot. Uh, starting challenging university work at 10 p.m. at night and doing that till 2 a.m. in the morning. I mean, I I don't have as many kids as you, and maybe I'm I have less energy than you, but that sounds so challenging. Um, and I, I suppose I'm trying to reconcile your positive demeanor with mm -hmm. what I perceive as a really challenging situation. And so I was wondering if you could give us some more information on how you understand yourself as a shift parent. Um, is that a, a manageable no. scenario? It was, I started with, all the experience with all, with all of the energy and, you know, I was doing so well, but you can't keep up that momentum. The wheels fall off the wagon very fast and you get exhausted. Um, I started in 2019, so I'll finish 2024, but that's five years of very, very limited sleeping and a lot of stress. And like I said, the wheels fall off the wagon. However, for me to keep that momentum up, I look at myself in an incredibly privileged position. I can afford three days a week childcare for my youngest. My other three are at school. If I couldn't afford childcare for my youngest, I wouldn't be able to do this. And that would leave me in a position where I wouldn't be able to improve our family position. I'm doing this for my family. I'm doing this as an example for my children that you can, we can make ourselves better. But if we were in a position that we couldn't afford that support and I had to work because I'm not working now, the, the cost of living every single week that I go to do the groceries, I think maybe I should just put uni on hold and get a job because I've got some sort of qualifications now. I might be able to get something, but I don't think if I, I would finish. So I have to keep that momentum up. It is difficult. It is challenging. I find myself applying for extensions that I promised myself I never would. However, life gets in the way, but I'm committed to doing this. And in a lot of my research throughout the degree so far, I tend to focus on areas and topics that affect parents. My Where I want to work later on is within parents and carers. I want to do, I want to help people from an early intervention perspective on how to, how to manage all their, their life so that they can improve themselves. So this is really, this, this project that you're working on is fantastic because I can see that there's going to be a support for us so that those people that don't come from the best socioeconomic background can actually, you know, do something and we've got the support to actually get ourselves into a better position. So I think that that's my driving force, that I want to better my family and I want to better myself and I'm not going to give up. And with this support, it helps me. At this point in time where I feel like I could give up, just this last semester, this was such a help because I honestly wanted to throw in the towel because it just got too hard. So this actually helped me just get over the So huge. Well, I reckon I'm speaking for many of us when I say thank you so much for your uh, strength and fortitude and also for being able to tell that without the barest hint of frustration, which I, I know that I wouldn't have been able to do. So very sincere thanks from all of us for that. Um, I'm going to turn to Kate Huppets now, and um, we're really thankful that Kate is participating in this conversation. So Kate, I just wanted to ask you, because you're someone who's got lots of experience um, in the gender equity uh, space, as they call it, but also with the SAGE accreditation work. And I'm wondering if you can tell us how Western Sydney, over a period of time, not just at the moment, um, has been trying to recognise and also to support student parents, please. Thanks, James. And I want to say thank you to Veronica as well. That was a very um, powerful discussion on the challenges that students face. Um, so SAGE very much focuses on uh, staff experiences, but we do look to see how there's a continuum between staff and student experiences. So CARE has been a particular swag for for sage and that's led by by chloe we are always thinking to how uh, hdr candidates are on their way to being staff members and so again there's really a, a clear continuum then in terms of experience um, 
one brilliant way in which we have managed to identify and advocate for student experiences is through the VC's gender equity um, projects. And those projects have identified the importance of the student par parent union uh, and also uh, has ensured that uh, student and staff parents are on the VC's gender equity committee. Uh, we also have had specific projects that have looked at HDR policy and experience and advocated for change in that space. Uh, and I know that um, Charlotte's done really important work too on international students and staff. And of course, you hosted a really important HDR morning tea. And we're seeing some advocacy and resources in schools go towards uh, HDR student carers. Then outside of SAGE, the Office of Equity and Diversity has done some important work in terms of building the parent and carer support toolkit. We have families week events uh, and the creation of the Parents and Carers Working Party, which is actually developing an action plan for change. Um, but certainly, you know, more needs to be done or always needs to be done. So, um, for example, in our schools, EDWP, we're just at the moment looking at a resource for uh, subject coordinators to provide to students at the beginning of semester that identifies all the resources that student carers can access and also to provide an information sheet to subject coordinators so they're really aware of the challenges that student carers face. Uh, we can see a, an important link there between student retention and, and caring experiences, as Veronica pointed out, you know, it is challenging being a student and having these care responsibilities. So more work obviously needs to be done in that space too. And on the school level, we're, we're looking to that too. Thanks, Kate. It's, it's really interesting to hear how a number of different uh, teams, pieces of the puzzle intersect and interlock. Um, it's really wonderful to hear your account of the EDWP, so the Equity and Diversity Working Party, how that uh, those efforts actually intersect with other efforts as well. And it's really lovely to see my humanities and communication arts colleagues, Alex Ling and Jess Simpson here, who've been leading the way um, on some of the HDR candidate financial support around childcare. And thanks also to Chloe for the broader conversation that is flowing on from there. So Kate, I was I was very surprised to get an email, um, well, not surprised, excited to get an email recently that said that you've been appointed to the National Advisory Committee for the Athena Swan Scheme. So I'm going to ask you to make a comment on the broader kind of national higher education uh, landscape too. Um, so are there particular trends or approaches that higher education institutions are using to understand and respond to a situation where, as I understand it, care and work are becoming more intermingled as gender equity uh, efforts advance? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. So Athena Swan, again, focuses on staff rather than, than students. Um, and there are broad issues that impact the sector. Most recently, since COVID, there's a broader acknowledge, acknowledgement of the need for flexible work. So that is something that I think is being pursued right across the sector. There's acknowledgement that care and care responsibilities interrupt career trajectories uh, and, you know, impact the number of women that we have in management and also the promotions uh, that we see uh, in the sector. We also know that we don't have enough data and uh, we've only had one advisory board committee <laughs> meeting so far, but um, one of the main issues that was addressed is the lack of data across the sector. So we need to make sure that we're collecting data on uh, staff and students who have care responsibilities and making sure that that's available so that universities and uh, SAGE representatives can actually develop responses that make a difference to people's lives. Because without the essential research, 
without the essential data, we don't know what the right course of action is. And that's something that the white paper identified as well, that we don't have enough data on childcare uh, and experiences of childcare. So Kate, then my final question, I, I, it's the question that we've got down in our shared notes, but I want to refine it a little bit. So flexibility here for me feels like the aspiration. Um, and I'm wondering if you can give us your thoughts on how feasible and a path forward, a, a potential path forward, um, or, or what sort of potential path forward you can imagine for the flexibility that is grasped as needing to uh, inform our understanding of care and work and their interrelation. Is that feasible for that to that flexible approach also to be applied to the undergraduate student experience? Yeah, it's certainly, and uh, Veronica talked about being time poor and the incredibly long days that Veronica has, and then the need to have extensions when she'd re really prefer not to. Um, I was just talking about this with our Dean actually in the last TDWP meeting about uh, how lack of time is you know, something that comes up again and again. So do we need a different approach to university timelines in order to respond to carers' needs? Perhaps that's something that we need to think about in the future. Thanks very much. And I think that that way of framing the question is much better than my garbled effort, at least. So thank you so much. And thank you very much to Donna, to Veronica and to Kate um, for their thoughts here. Um, I think that Salakshi is going to put the link to the white paper in the chat when she has a moment. She might have already done that and I've overlooked it and she's probably texting me and telling me that we're starting to run over time as well. So let's move on to the second of our two panels today, which is to interrogate the, not interrogate, to discuss and reflect on the crash care pilot at the Liverpool campus that Veronica was speaking to. Um, so I want to welcome Charlotte to Sassiwa, um, who was along with Jenna Condi, uh, the Western Sydney leaders of the program. Um, and that's a really nice message, Jenna. Um, it's nice to see you in the chat. Um, Teddy Nagadja, who is going to be speaking to uh, her evaluation of the report. And Brian, thank you so much for uh, virtually running from one meeting to another to join us as well. Brian Stout is the Dean of the School of Social Sciences and the Provost of the Liverpool campus. And we're going to ask him some simple questions and some more pointy questions about uh, the institution's understanding of this project and how it kind of continues on. So Charlotte, um, it's lovely to see you and thank you so much for um, your leadership and advocacy in this uh, space. I'm just wondering if you can tell us what the pilot program was. So what actually happened in the crash care pilot? Also, you're thinking on what um, situations it responded to and then what model of care the pilot provided. I'm sorry that that's actually three questions rather than one. Yeah, thank you, James. And uh, thanks everyone for joining us. Um, I want to, I don't know where, where to start, but uh, from week three to week 13 uh, of uh, the autumn spring semester, we actually provided fresh care for 10 children of students at Western, uh, Western Sydney Uni and at uh, Liverpool City campus. So every Friday uh, for four hours, we provided, uh, you know, crash care. And uh, the way it was uh, designed is we had uh, a room or space for, for the children. And then we also had uh, a co-working with, uh, you know, with crash, with crash where those student parents who wanted to stay and, and do some work, at least they had, uh, you know, space they could, uh, uh, you know, sit in and do some research uh, or work on their, on their assignments. So the way they, uh, the, the way crash was provided was really uh, dependent, it just depended on the available resources. And the reason why we decided to uh, provide a service this time rather than writing is because um, 
of course, there is existing research that really talks about the need for affordable childcare uh, for parents who are working, but also for you know students uh, you know at universities, and also we have our own lived experiences as uh, you know uh, parents who are working at Western University and also uh, you know as 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 student parents, and and uh, we know very well that uh, you know. If universities provide childcare, that's one direct way of, uh, you know, supporting the educational uh, pursuits of its, uh, you know, of their students. So that's why we decided to, you know, actually go in and look at how, a, you know, a fresh care model would work at, you know, at at uh, at, at campus. Uh, so after writing the white paper, you know, when Jenna finished writing up, we decided to meet uh, and see how we could what we should do next after the, you know, after this white paper. And so in that meeting that we had, we decided to, uh, you know, approach organizations, community-based organizations in Liverpool, which were working in the area of childcare. And this is how we approached uh, Liverpool Neighborhood Connections. And I'm really glad that uh, the CEO and uh, the coordinator, so Pat Hall and, uh, and Nidhi are here, we really, uh, you know, appreciate that uh, the support they provided. So when we approached uh, Liverpool Neighborhood Connections, we in that meeting we shared, you know, our common interests. We were all interested in supporting, uh, you know, women who are also from a uh, disadvantaged background. So we had, we had uh, for over an hour we had the conversation, and that conversation resulted into Liverpool Neighborhood Connections, uh, you know, providing in kind support to actually try or pilot fresh at Liverpool City campus. And, uh, and um, I think for me, that meeting was really the game changer. So they provided us with uh, two childcare workers who are well qualified. And then of course, because they, they, uh, they have the mobile uh, you know, childcare uh, service, they had toys, they had insurance as well, the public liability insurance. So they said we will give you that for the whole semester. You run the, you know, you run the, the the crash care, and you see how it works. And after providing us that uh, in kind support, we started the hustle of seeking permission from the university to actually provide, uh, you know, a room or space where crash would, uh, you know, would 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 run. So uh, the first people that we approached definitely was uh, the Liverpool uh, Provost and uh, Dean School of Social Sciences. Uh, Brian Stout was very, very supportive as well as uh, uh, this uh, School of Social Sciences uh, School Manager, uh, Lauren. And that started with a visit, uh, you know, walking around Liverpool City campus to find which room would actually accommodate, uh, you know, crash. And, um, uh, and we got some rooms and that uh, after finding some rooms, of course, some were really small, others had like, like natural light. So we zeroed down to some spaces and we invited Liverpool Neighborhood Connections to come and do uh, you know, risk assessment of the, of the spaces that we had, uh, you know, we had uh, identified. So we managed to get uh, you know, a room that we now uh, asked uh, the Division of Infrastructure and Commercial Operations, uh, you know, to approve and give us permission to actually uh, run the crash care there. So you have asked me to talk about the kind of uh, situations that uh, the crash care responded to. And when we, we put in an expression of interest and, you know, really circulated it uh, on the email list, asking student parents who are interested in uh, bringing their children for crash care at Liverpool campus. And in that uh, expression of interest form, we asked the students to tell us why this childcare service is of interest to them. And I'll read out some of the responses, uh, you know, that the students gave, which really speak to the, you know, the situations or the kind of target uh, group that really utilize the crash service. So one of the students said, I have no care for my daughter on Friday and I have classes. I either have to take her to class with me or try to find a carer or miss class. For me, that was really very, uh, you know, very, very concerning that someone has to make a choice of either attending class or 
uh, trying to run around looking for, you know, for a carer. The other student said, I am interested in crash at Liverpool campus because it's on campus. So this sort of, uh, you know, positions, childcare at Liverpool campus makes it like one-stop shopping center or uni where you go to class, leave your children also as well to attend, uh, you know, their crash care, and then you do your business and after that you go home. And the other student uh, said, I'm interested in this service so that I can study as I am a single mom. You know, it's, that's, uh, that's uh, you know, single mom definitely now brings in, uh, you know, clearly uh, affordability issues, depending on uh, one income and all that, uh, that, that impacts on affordability of the mainstream uh, long day care centers. And then uh, another student, I'm unable to get childcare anywhere. I have been on wait lists since pregnancy. And it's also uh, convenient for study and work. So we are providing a service to students who have been on waiting lists to get into their long day care centers. So we know very well, uh, like what Donna was talking about, child care deserts, especially in Liverpool, there's not really enough space uh, for the children. And then also I want, it, the crash care will help me to bring my children, my kids with me and live at the same day. And lastly, I have tutorials every second Friday. My son's preschool days are Monday, Monday to Wednesday. This service would be great, especially since finding a babysitter every second Friday is really difficult. So we are, uh, you know, we provided a service that is not really competing with the already existing early learning centers because this is unaffordable for some of our students. And then also Liverpool, uh, you know, lacking uh, any existing early learning uh, center, but then also providing quality childcare uh, for the, you know, for the student parents who brought, you know, their children. So beyond really just doing child minding, we are really concerned about the materials, the educational materials and the, uh, and the activities that the students were doing. And that was an area that was handled very well by Liverpool Neighborhood uh, Connections. Thank you. Thanks, Charlotte. It, um, as with some of our other panelists, I reckon you've answered all of my questions in one go. So let me kind of make a little reflection and then throw it back to you, because what we're talking about here are multiple models of care, right? And it's interesting to observe the dominance of the long day care model in many discussions around care. Um, and I was wondering if you could give us some more information about uh, what you observed and what you personally experienced in terms of the particular type of care that um, children experienced in the pilot. Um, and you and me have discussed previously sometimes the experience of long day care, and I'm definitely guilty of this, where you kind of throw your kid over the fence and say, see you later, I'll see you in 15 hours, and then run away to go and do some work. And from my understanding, that's a very different um, model to the pilot and it's potentially more caring and more inclusive, more uh, thoughtful or situated kind of uh, model of care. Yeah, ab absolutely. So uh, the students who participated in the, you know, crash, uh, crash care at Liverpool campus, some of them were first time uh, mothers that also were, had had their children, their children had not attended the, uh, any long daycare center or daycare center. So some of them were actually like really uh, nervous and, uh, and anxious about leaving their children, uh, you know, and, uh, and leaving them in care and then going for, you know, to attend class. So we had, uh, you know, we had uh, such students coming in and we also had uh, students who wanted to continue breastfeeding uh, their children. Uh, and and providing an on-site care uh, meant that they could go to their tutorials or their class or do their research in the library and still come back and uh, and feed their children. And then also we had, um, uh, you know, we had uh, some parents who were toilet training their children. So that means they would hang around, uh, you know, and Liverpool has very good uh, spaces and uh, very quiet spaces that you could also sit and work in. And then, uh, you know, they then uh, you they would come in to check on their children and to take them for toilet. So the crash model is that 
children, I mean, parents have to stay on site. You can't leave uh, the campus where the children are. And uh, the child care workers do not do nappy change or do not take, uh, you know, this, the children to toilet physics. So the parents have to be, uh, you know, they have to, they have to be called in to do that. And that's the role that we were playing, uh, you know, with Jenna. So we were, we were mediating between the child care workers if they needed any parent uh, to come back and, and, you know, and check on the, you know, on their child. That's something that we had, uh, we had to do. Yeah. So I really think uh, the child care model, uh, the crash care model targets or meets needs of a certain, uh, you know, cohort of Western Sydney University students. And uh, and it's not really competition with the other long day care center models that we have. And plus this service was, you know, provided free of charge. So that was a very big uh, relief. And uh, for some of the students who are already struggling with high cost of living and the high uh, child, care, child care fees. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a transformative element of the program, I think, is the ability to um, address some inequities by providing uh, free or relatively more affordable care as well in this model. Um, and it was interesting to read in the newspaper today some continuing advocacy around um, expectations for the New South Wales government to support uh, parents who are putting their children into care. Charlotte, is there anything else you want to add at this point or shall I move on and um, come to Teddy? Yeah, no, I just want to say a big thank you to, uh, you know, everyone who made uh, the project possible, especially uh, Dr. Jenna Kondi. I know this, uh, you were not, we're not able to see you, but Jenna was really and is very uh, phenomenal, very phenomenal leader. And also the LNC and the whole, the Western Sydney University itself for uh, clearing and giving us permission to run crash, as well as the student and staff partners that we were working with. Thanks, Charlotte. And I wanted to say thank you on behalf of all of us to you as well. Um, it's lots of your really hard work and advocacy that's really important too. Um, and it's really nice to be able to have a critical conversation on these issues, but also to be thankful at the same time. It's a really lucky uh, position we all find ourselves in. So I'll turn now... That's all right. Um, I'll turn now to Teddy. Um, so you've written a report that uh, documents and assesses the pilot. So if you can tell us a little bit about what you think the pilot achieved, um, and then I wonder if it would be also appropriate for you to talk the group through the report's recommendations looking forward. Thank you, James. Uh... First, I want to first congratulate my colleagues, uh, Dr. Gina Kondi and uh, Dr. Charlotte uh, to Sassiri for this really tremendous and transformative initiative. I think they've done a lot of good work and this is one way they have supported students. So congratulations to you both. But I also want to thank the colleagues I worked with on this evaluation, and that's the Lakshi and Shell P. Thank you so much for your support. Um, James, just to give you um, also a brief background in terms of uh, who were the service users, because that's really important for us to understand who were these service users. These were students uh, who were coming from suburbs that you would consider to be socioeconomically disadvantaged. And, uh, and in one way, these are suburbs that are at a risk of uh, becoming um, childcare deserts. But most of these students also did not have substantial sources of income. And that, 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 that was a key thing, yet they had so many caring responsibilities. Uh, for instance, uh, we, we, we had uh, a student who was both a student, a care of older people, and also a parent, and was also dependent on one income. So there was this triad of identities that come with multiple roles, but with a uh, limited income to access any form of child care. So we had service users who are falling within that category of really precarious living conditions. 
in terms of lack of employment and uh, no significant income. So one of the things we, we, we had a conversation about with the service users was we wanted to really understand what were their routine practices like in terms of uh, childcare practices and their study life before engaging with the crash project. And uh, I can tell you uh, just hearing their stories uh, is, is a very good eye opener, but it also puts a lot of uh, pressure on all of us to do something. And some of the things they highlighted were obviously the cost of childcare that it's too expensive to afford, given that somebody is not employed and they're a student and they have all these other multiple responsibilities. So the cost of childcare is uh, really skyrocketing and un unaffordable. But there was also an element of missed university experience. They didn't feel like students. They spend most of their days and time caring for their children and doing house chores and not coming to the university. So there's that lack of engagement with what makes you a student, what makes you a university sort of student. So there was that sense of disconnection between being a man and a student. So that sort of identity as a student was being lost. More so, there was also um, disruption to how they manage their studies and how they manage uh, their personal lives. They didn't have enough time. Many of the students, uh, service users that we, we had a conversation with in terms of how they were managing before joining the crash project, they had disruptions in their everyday activities in terms of how they care for their children, but also in terms of how they study. So they had to shift day activities to night time. That means they had to do all their assessments, all their writings, all their research work in the middle of the night or in the wee hours of the morning. And what that meant that they were also experiencing what we call, what we call the self-care struggles that there was no element of self-care. There was sleep deprivation. I mean, uh, for those of you who teach and see students who look like they're really tired in the, wheel, in the morning hours, these are some of the reasons. And this is why probably we need to do something about this. So they were not having enough sleep. Somebody goes to sleep at 3 a.m. Any sleep after 12, we all know, is not quality sleep. So there were so many struggles of self-care. But there were also, which was so threatening, uh, thoughts of suicidal thoughts, because they were failing to manage both their personal and student life and any other activity within their lives. So one participant felt like, my life should come to an end because I just don't understand how I can balance being a man, being a student and being a carer. So these are all sorts of uh, self struggles that were identified when we we're having um, a conversation with uh, the service users before their engagement in the crash project. But after the engagement in the crash project, uh, we could see um, the difference it made. It was only a few weeks, but the difference was huge. And one of the things that uh, service users identified or talked about really was the enhanced student identity, but also their ability to manage their time, to do assessments, to do their other research work, and to do anything that is university related. So they felt like they're students now. So one student actually, one service user said, I feel more of a student than a mom, which shows that it is very important for us to be able to appreciate the, 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 the intersectionality of being a student and a parent, but being, being able to value both in that space, that the student is able to be, proud as, to be proud as a student, but also able to be proud as a mom and not either or. 
So there was that sense of satisfaction that now they feel more of students and they can identify with the university. But there was also reduced um, sort of separation anxiety. And I think um, Veronica and uh, Charlotte have mentioned this, particularly for first time mothers, they felt like having an on campus sort of care, crash care services helped reduce in that, so reduce the separation anxiety because they were very close to their children. They could monitor them in case there was anything they needed to do. But at the same time, they were able to do their studies within that same space. So there was a peace of mind that everything was happening in the same space and in a space they thought was safe and conducive for both of them. Also, they talked about the co-working uh, space because as Charlotte described the design of the crash uh, care model, there was a separate uh, co-working space, which was private, quiet, where they could go and do their studies. And it was just adjacent to where the crash was. So that gave them the proximity to their children within just seconds. And they didn't have to go anywhere uh, to read or do any other thing. But uh, more to that in terms of managing their studies, they, they were able to talk about things like, we were able to use the library services they weren't able to use. We normally ask students whether they are looking for all these resources and researching, but these are some of the challenges they're experiencing that they can't use the resources with that we have at campus. But with the crash care that we provided, they were able to use the library services to be able to uh, engage with their assessments in a more academic way. So those are some of the things that came out of uh, <clears throat> the evaluation, very much focused on uh, being able to engage with the academics, with the academic work, being able to separate home from university, being able to have that sense of community because as they met at the crash, there was that sense of community and they felt that they are connected to other student parents, but also feeling that they are valued as students, but also as parents. So they felt that the, the university uh, valued them in that sense. More so, and most importantly, they appreciated the quality of care that was provided. Uh, many of them spoke about um, the warmness and friendliness of the personnel that were providing care, the educators, but also they, they, they felt that their children were very happy. And um, one mother said that, uh, her child looked forward to going to university with her. And that was good kind of early role modeling of the value of university uh, studies. So there was that whole lot of um, appreciation in terms of the quality of care, um, in terms of being able to now do their assessments without having to ask for extensions and so on, and being able to manage their lives. Did you want me to talk about the recommendations now or that's later? No, no, let's go for it. I think that's a really, okay. um, All right. that's the next step. And I think you've, I mean, I'm, I'm guessing, but given the uh, unanimously positive set of effects you've identified, I can imagine what the recommendations are going to suggest. Yes, uh, you can guess. And the first one obviously is the university should invest resources in a more permanent and regular and flexible crash care services at Liverpool campus. And we can replicate the model somewhere else uh, in our other campuses that are located within marginalized neighborhoods because it's proven that it works. And if the university can do that, one of the things we highlighted, which still came from uh, the narratives of the service users, is that if we can have the establishment of a permanent um, sort of crash care services at campus, one of the things we will achieve is building a strong sense of student identity 
but also building that sense of belonging as student parents. Students need to feel that they are proud students at the same time proud parents in the same space. So that is really important, but it will also create a safe and healthy sort of environment where they can share experiences. Because on their own, they think that the problems are unique to themselves, yet the problems are similar. So when they have a space where they can share their lived experiences, the weight is lifted off them and they can share some strategies they use in their different ways. So the university should invest in establishing a more permanent uh, sort of facility. The second recommendation that uh, we made was about uh, establishing partnerships that will support somehow the sustainability of uh, this crash care facility at the university. Working with LNC, for instance, was such a, a great opportunity that showed the value of partnerships. Otherwise, probably we, we, we couldn't have pulled this through. So there's need to establish partners that can support uh, the provision of services and partners that are within the local community such that we keep growing the local and working with the local community. The third recommendation was engaging all stakeholders in what we called a, a core design crash dialogue. Whoever needs to kind of contribute to what would make this model work and in what ways, in what design, in what space, we need to have that sort of co-design dialogue with the different stakeholders for purposes of having input, uh, proper input and owning the entire sort of uh, initiative. And the uh, fourth recommendation we made uh, that was made was about if the crash uh, care facility is to continue, could we please extend the hours of operation and the days of operation? So one day was obviously not enough and not all students come on, one day, on that one day of the week. So it's important that at least it operates five days a week and that will be more inclusive and more accessible to more students. And the last one, which I, I think is on a minor note, is about improving the booking process uh, by developing an app, an application rather than through emails that makes it more modern maybe than just going the email way. So the recommendations are seven, but those ones that I've just shared with you were the most important, particularly in terms of making sure we have a, a permanent crash care at Liverpool. Thanks, James. Lovely. Thanks very much, Teddy. Um, it's so wonderful to have a thorough assessment with data and strong reflection, buttressing an assessment of the program. Um, and it's really lovely to be in a room with lots of people who are um, committed to continuing these conversations. So, Brian, I'm going to come across to you now. Um, as I was thinking before I made the mistake of looking up the definition of provost um, and provost is a largely hierarchical word deriving out of universities and militaries, which I think is interesting. So for the purposes of today, let's think about a provost as being uh, a leader among equals rather than only in hierarchies. But it's we really appreciate your time. Um, and I'm just wondering if you can give us a brief comment on the program as you have supported it and fostered it and what you think its achievements have been. Um, thank, thanks, um, James. Uh, provost um, or campus provost in, in our university has the primary responsibility for for happiness and well-being in, in, on on that campus. So yeah, whether it's it's, it's certainly not hierarchical. Um, th thank thank you. Um, I mean, I don't have an awful lot to to, to add to, to what's been been said um, from 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 Charlotte and Teddy, but I will I will just say a couple of things. Um, when when I was approached um, by um, Charlotte and and Jenna initially about the, about this initiative and with the 
request um, to to support it. Um, the, the the condition I, I thought it was a great con um, in, in initiative, but the condition that I made was that if we were going to pilot, we had to have a proper evaluation. I, I think um, it is one of my pet hates that as a as an educational in institution, the amount of times the amount of time we spend doing things without really measuring and um, what what why, whether they're effective or saying why we're doing them um, is 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 a is a bit destructive. Um, I I but. They they were very quick to agree to that, and, and and I think what what Teddy and her team has done is is an excellent report. Um, I think for for me the um the. There, there was some some learning. There have there have been it's been very focused on on the positives. Um, I think um Charlotte did um gloss over perhaps some of the challenges that she and Jen and others overcame in in doing that. Um, the the walking um what 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 she didn't say was when we walked around the, the campus and identified the best rooms for running this crash. Those weren't actually the rooms we ended up using, um, because there was reasons why we couldn't do that, and there was particular um barriers on 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 those sorts of things. So we ended up using a learning space, and they and they made a a, 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 a great job of making that work. But it's it's not ideal. There there was was um, a lot of moving around the furniture and uh, me having to check that my staff weren't lifting anything unless they'd done their heavy lifting training. So I was assured everything was on wheels. That was okay. Um, but also the other side of using a learning space is to pick up to, 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 to Teddy's point is um, the, the time when we have most demand is when the learning spaces aren't available um, because we, there are times in, 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 in Liverpool where all the learning spaces are used. So we, it was actually, it wasn't just that it was used on, on one day a week. It was used as a quieter um, day on, on, on the Friday because that's where we, we had the space. Um, I think that the, the idea that the people who used it would find it useful, obviously, I, I wouldn't have thought that's a surprising finding. But I think some of the other findings, um, I think, are really, really helpful. So I think that, and that's very helpful too, of course. But the, the point about student identity and connection, I think, is really important. The, 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 the information in the report about having this crash makes people feel more connected to the university is really because that's something that's a really big issue for us as a, as a university we know we have a lot of hit and run um students who um come into class maybe don't speak to anybody leave again go back to their homes go back to their jobs and anything that we do that makes people feel that the university is looking after them is a good thing and the second part of that is that connection to other students and um, the idea that and again this is partly because it's a quieter time of the week but the idea that not only do you um can you drop your kids off and um, and um, go to class you can drop your kids off and study and perhaps study with other parents meet other parents have that sort of um connection as well that seemed really that seems really important so so that bit about it not just being uh a functional, I mean, to, to use your, your own words, um, James, throw the kid over the wall and pick them up again at the end of the day. It, it was much more than that. It was much more of a of, of, of a connected thing. And the other thing that I think, again, I don't know if it's a surprising finding or not, um, but we weren't trying, we as you said, we don't have an early learning centre in, in Liverpool. Uh, the, 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 the idea behind that was the university's idea when Liverpool campus was, was developed was that whenever, because the early learning centres, I'm sitting in Parramatta South and I'm just a few hundred metres from it at the moment. The, the, these are private facilities and the early learning centres, they are, they're used, I, I know that I don't have the figures to hand, but I know they'd be presented um, to the Equity and Diversity Committee. They are used by some students. They are used more by staff than by students and all our learning early learning centers do have um people from the community who use them who drop their their kids off so and it's all it's it's paid um child care so this was this was not that this was occasional crash facility and it was free and the idea and obviously being free is a great benefit but the the benefit of having something occasional the difference between having a little being an awful lot better than having nothing, I think it's a really important finding as well. And so for, for the university's point of view, the idea that we don't need to be replicating or providing you know, all childcare for all students and staff at all times, because I don't think that's a real, realistic aspiration, but the idea that we can do some things that don't necessarily need to be majorly onerous or majorly expensive, and that can have a big impact on, on our student and staff population. I think that's a really important finding as well. Thanks very much, Brian. And obviously I couldn't possibly tell you this, but there was a stage on the Thursday before the first 
um, Friday crash session where I was going to drop some tools up to Jenna so she could pull apart some desks on Friday morning to make the space more amenable. So, you know, there's there's always adaptive ways of thinking. So if I can go back to this idea of partnership then, so, and this is the last question I suggested we might discuss, um, is the partnership model, so here between LNC and the university and, and potentially also bringing in the council, is this the kind of path forward that you imagine as the most feasible way to continue these types of adaptable and affordable occasional care in our context at the university? Um, well, as, as, a, as a way into that, I would just say um, LNC are brilliant. They 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 are they, the impact that they make on on Liverpool. I I don't go to Western Sydney um, awards event without seeing LNC winning something, and often it's winning something for that something that they have just um, they they have just developed. Or I didn't know what was happening till a year ago, or some of the, the leaders were doing that. But in terms of their engagement with their community, the idea of meeting the needs, the idea of and the you know I I, I did I I was very impressed with Charlotte Ted and um and Jenna's strategic thinking and quoting from some of my own work and putting the proposal um, and, and and appealing to my ego um, and putting that together. But we did. Um, Teddy and I did do some work about that place-based approach in, in LNC and that idea that childcare is not an afterthought but it's absolutely integral that if we are providing something for you know a lot of their work is with migrant um, women if we're providing something for migrant women you don't develop a program and then think oh what are going to do with the children it, it is absolutely part of that so what what they it, it is a, the perfect example of a partnership because they bring things that we don't have that community connections as, as I think Charlotte referred to the qualifications that they have even the the practical toys and things that they could bring along that that is that is really important um so i so i do think that 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 is i mean partnerships are almost always the 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 best solution the, there is obviously a harder question about about funding and um, so it is a question when when it, it's a pilot and, and the the provost committee provided the funding for the evaluation and um, you know there was no charges from the university for um for, for the use of the rooms but on, on and it was it was volunteer labor um, i'm not sure that's a model and in, in, in the future and, that, and that's the thing that we need to be careful of is that we have a partnership model but it can't be an exploitative partnership model if there if it is going to be something um that we're doing somebody somewhere is is, is going to have to fund it um so 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 yes i think partnerships are um definitely the way forward i would say that i mean this worked really well in liverpool all our campuses are different all the the, the context the environment the potential partners um are different and, and this again was a was a great success here in that it, it did develop from an existing relationship with the community partner who work who's, who's working in that in that way Thanks, Brian. And you've you've foreclosed the question I was about to ask you, which was I wanted to ask you about the Bankstown campus, which also doesn't have a collocated um, long day care centre at the moment as well. But I, I do grasp, as you say, the place-based research says that these things and place-based practice says that these things need to be developed organically and with a mind to the relationships that already exist as well. Um, so we're going to move on to the Q&A in a moment, but I just wanted to ask you this question, Brian, and I'm not sure how constrained you are in, in how you can respond, but um, given the, the significant level of support that is coming in the assessment, um, and I probably will ask you only about the Liverpool campus because you're the provost there, but are you supportive of this program being rolled out again? And um, um, ha, ha, sorry, and I was, I'll, I'll add to that as well. I mean, do we have mechanisms in mind or do you have mechanisms in mind around funding? Because as you say, we want this to be an appropriate and uh, equitable partnership, not an uneven partnership that starts to develop. Um, I, I, I mean, the first question is is, is is easy one, which yes, I am I am supportive. I think it's a it's a great project. There's no reason not to 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 run it out. The the second question is a more difficult one about how that would be. Uh, it is my i mean if i'm not getting a broader issue about space but um, it is my view that if, if this is something that we're going to do um 
I mean, obviously with Liverpool and with Bankstown as well, these are campuses that are built now. But even within that constraint, there are better places on the campus that this could be run. And um, and I and I think doing some some auditing and looking how that work um, would would be done. I think in terms of all, and I, and I, I I mean, I'm not sure we need to pilot it again. I mean, piloting kind of helps, but maybe we do. Maybe with new partners that it might be the piloting elsewhere. Um, I I do think. There is that broader question, and we we this was presented to so the equity and diversity um co committee met last week, and and um, and thanks to to Charlotte for, for providing the report ahead of the launch, and I was able to give some headlines there. It's very very well received. Um, we will it doesn't meet again until twenty twenty four, and we would like um I mean I I don't chair that committee, but I I would like the um the team to be invited to give the presentation of possibly a slightly shorter version than, than you gave today. There's a lot of interest, a lot of positivity in that. I think the, the big question is, what is the university's responsibility um, to um, to provide childcare for, for students and staff? And I think um, and I think this report really helps nuance that question because um, I think sometimes it's easier to push that back and to say, well, you know, pe people, there's childcare uh, facilities at some on campus, some nearby. It's up to parents to sort that out for themselves. But I think this report shows that it's not it's not as binary as that. There are lots of things that the university can do that that are short of free childcare all the time for everybody. Um, it is uh, um, there. There's other things, other models, other partnerships that that can bring significant benefit. Thanks, Brian. And I, I suppose just thinking about next steps as well, it seems really necessary to ensure that this report is um, circulated. It's spoken to, spoken to at the Vice Chancellor's Gender Equity and Respectful Relationships Committee, but also at the advisory group that Chloe is um, leading at the moment as well, because we need multiple avenues where uh, these conversations can be advanced. And um, both those groups are very much committed to working out new approaches to these challenges, especially in the context of new campuses. Um, and that's, you're potentially going to hear some drilling. There's still some uh, work going on at Bankstown. So um, I'm going to mute myself in a moment. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, we've got about 10 minutes for questions and comments. So I'd love to just throw it open for anyone who wanted to immediately uh, make a statement or make a question. Um, and I'll leave a short kind of pregnant pause for anyone to jump in. Otherwise I'll kind of pose some questions and go from there. Go for it, Chloe. Yeah, this is really wonderful to hear. And I suppose the big question in my head is, is, is around what we've just been talking about there about the sustainability. I think I love Brian's point about um, even a little bit makes a huge difference. And I think we've got to be realistic um, about being able to provide childcare and how much. Um, what what were the, I just out of interest, I think you said it was, it was for weeks three to 13, autumn and spring, is that right? Um, so presumably not, not covering exam period, which I know can be challenging for students as well. Um, interested to know what the cost was, and presumably, if we were to know the the cost and and the sort of realistic ideal, we'd we'd have a better idea of how much we would need to to support this. What what was the cost of, of running it um, for for the university or the partner or however it worked? I think you're the answer here, Charlotte. Yeah, so we did, uh, I think the highest uh, uh, cost of running crash is around the, the child care uh, workers. And, uh, you know, the workers were being paid $38, so 50, $42 if you include uh, uh, super, their superannuation. And uh, apart from the, so the more workers, definitely you times that amount of money. And then uh, plus uh, insurance, and then, um, uh, and then the toy is definitely buying some child-friendly, uh, you know, educative materials and and, and toys and uh, administrative support. So we did, we did do most of the work ourselves, like um, using that teaching space. We had to move the furniture ourselves, but the person, uh, the removal is asked for one thousand two hundred dollars if they were to do it per, you know, per session. 
and uh, we didn't have the budget, so we had to do that. So if the crash is to run, we have to look at the space as well, and uh, may probably space without all this furniture that needs to to be moved around, and then also the room, uh, the space that we end up using has to have some changes, at least some decorate decoration or design changes, so that it fits. Uh, you know, for, you know, the children. And um, yeah, so I think maybe around 50,000 to run the crash project for a, a semester uh, if we did it full time yeah. for eight children. So if we have more, then we have more children as well. And you mentioned using, the, sorry for my follow up, um, using, uh, well, Liverpool campus and potentially Bankstown because they don't have the long day childcare but presumably there isn't I don't know a, a conflict there those childcare centers are providing a different um service they're also incredibly full um presumably there is need across all campuses um uh, particularly for students who can't afford that regular um that flat spot at, at those childcare centers are there and you said it's helpful for the students to be on campus um close to where their students are for the, for the crash and they need to be. So other particular spots, and you said there are um, areas where there are, uh, there's a lack of, of childcare, the particular campuses that would be a priority. So definitely uh, Liverpool and, uh, and, um, and Bankstown, but also Parramatta. Because uh, we Parramatta South, we didn't have uh, international student parents enroll in the you know in the crash care because most of the students are usually at Parramatta South, especially when you look at uh, the social work uh, social work program, Masazim social work program, uh, where we have most of the international students who are parents. But also, we didn't have HDR uh, parents enroll in the crash program and we had a we had a wait list at liverpool because of the budget we could only have uh we could only have eight children supported every friday because we had only two uh you know child care workers so i think um if we target hdr students and also uh masters and bachelor's students at liverpool campus so those campuses that don't have any uh, any any long daycare center at all, but then also thinking about uh, the other students who are, uh, you know, who can't afford the mainstream or the long daycare center, and that would include, uh, you know, uh, Parramatta South as well. Thanks, Charlotte. Yeah, that's what I think. I don't know, Teddy, if you want to add something from your evaluation. I think looking at the type of service users we had, it will be very important going forward to kind of either conduct a survey to see what are the diversities, what are the different types of students we have in the different campuses, because the level of precarity is different. And that also um, depends on where they live and what is in that area that is accessible in terms of uh, childcare. So we may need to have a deep understanding going forward in terms of who are the students who are experiencing this childcare crisis. Whereas many need it, but there are those we can consider as experiencing the crisis that we may want to focus on. Thanks, Teddy. It's really interesting as well, because I think the crisis framing is important in some regards, but potentially also a challenge in others, because my understanding of the crash pilot is that it is advancing an alternative model of care. And so there are actually potentially the possibility in a, um, a different future for um, multiple uh, care models to be deployed at the same campus as well. Although I grasp that given the current challenges, it's um, important to prioritise those campuses where care is least accessible. Um, Jennifer, I'm wondering if you're happy to speak your question. Yeah, so it's not really a question as such. It's more of a comment or I don't know what to call it. Um, you can decide. So I just wanted to say it's a fantastic initiative and um, I really feel like it should be rolled out um, 
at the other campuses because there is obviously, as we know, the long daycares, but they're permanent positions. And I've had this issue now with my first child and now I've had a second child where I call them and I'm like, I need one casual day because I have to teach on this particular day that's not on the day that my child has childcare, like a, the regular childcare that we use. Um, and they're like, sorry, this is services. The casual service is only for students. Um, only students can book into this service. Uh, there's no way, you know, um, I know I'm a different, I'm in a more privileged position. I'm, I can pay and I'm happy to pay. You know, I don't, it's not about the cost of all. I can pay for it, but they just say there is nothing available for you at all as a staff member. So um, I find that's an issue and I don't even know who to go to about that or who to speak to about that, that there's just no option for a staff member to book a casual day, even though that casual day might not be used by a, by a student and it just goes begging, like it's just an empty spot that is not used at all. Thanks, Jennifer. It's certainly a complicated situation, there's no doubt. I know that um, there was a recent gender equity funded report which... Um, advocated for uh, the expansion of casual uh, days and access in the co-located um, early learning centres. And my understanding is that um, while there has been that initial achievement of a single place allocated for a potential student to take up, I wonder if that's a continuing conversation about trying to expand that definition, but also expand the number of places available as well. And so I mean, Kieran McKay has been um, especially supportive on some of these issues and that 99.7% occupancy rate statistic is directly from Kieran recently. Um, so, you know, there's lots of people working in a number of different ways to seek to advance um, that particular conversation as well. Yeah. yeah, when I asked, they just said, look, you can book into a permanent position, but that's all we can offer you. And I'm like, I don't want to take the permanent position. I just need the one day, but they're like, sorry they can yeah. do and I had to actually change my timetable um, for teaching around this issue yeah and it speaks again to a, a point that Jenna recently reiterated to me which is about flexibility as one of the key uh, contributions of this particular pilot um, we've got a brief amount of time I wonder if there's one more person who's got a question or a comment Well, a final pregnant pause is a nice way to end. So thank you so much to everyone for your contributions today and for your patience over the 90 minutes of our conversation. Um, and I wanted to conclude by saying thanks to all of you for listening and for um, contributing and for your ongoing efforts, which for many of you I know is not just about showing up today, but in many different spaces. Um, and thanks to Charlotte and to Teddy and Thalakshi for all your efforts in making sure that this event uh, was critical and thoughtful and well attended. Um, so thank you so much to the three of you and thanks to you all and I hope you all have a lovely afternoon.